Good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone see my screen? It says, welcome to the CSAC meeting. If you can, please um, nod or say yes. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Yes. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, good afternoon. My name is Amanda Kristen. I am the Complete Streets Advisory Committee um, Manager. And thank you for joining us today. I'm going to read some of the information that's on your screen for um, ADA purposes. To better everyone's experience, use toolbars at the bottom for controls. Please mute your microphone unless speaking. Phone users dial star six. To ask a question or comment, please raise your virtual hand and phone users dial star nine. There's some photographs there of where those icons can be found on your screen in case, in case you have not become intimately familiar with the Zoom platform over the last year and a half. We have a, um, a great meeting for you today. And I'm gonna start with pulling up the information about Mentimeter because we do have six interesting questions today. So that's your code. The Mentimeter code is on the um, left-hand side of your screen. You can use your phone um, to capture that photograph of that QR code to bring you to the voting site. As usual, Ms. Stephanie Garcia will be administering the Mentimeter um, for us today. The voting code is 79261308. And the website can be accessed at www.menti.com forward slash ed48 ftma33. And that will be shown a couple of more times throughout the course of the program so that you can um, make sure that you are able to participate. So the first thing that we're going to go over today is MPO current efforts. We usually do this. Um, I have a little something to share with you today for um, I just read about this. People for Bikes is a, an organization that I'm sure lots of you are very familiar with. Um, they do, uh, they have, at, they are advocates for uh, better biking communities and they actually rate the communities based on facilities and um, safety measures, all sorts of different things. But they started something about six months ago called Advocacy Academy. And this is a series of videos and I'm going to show you a um, just a, a one minute video synopsis of those of those videos but there's lessons from the best biking cities that's i think a six series six video series and they're very short you know five minutes or under each the second is understanding the people for bikes rating system so that if you want to achieve a better rating if you're in a city that's large enough to uh, be considered for people by, by people for bikes for um, a community rating uh, that'll give you more understanding of of the uh, of the metrics of how they get to their the ratings for those cities and the last which I think is the most interesting to me is how to make a city great for bikes so I'm just going to go ahead and play this so that we can see what this is all about. Difficult to hear. Okay. Um, well, they can be reached at peopleforbikes.org and you can search Advocacy Academy and you can watch this video again or you can get much more information about the videos um, and, and why they chose to produce them. And um, now Stephanie Garcia will talk about a couple of things, the Broward bike map and tactical urbanism. Thank you so much, Amanda. Uh, first of all, I want to know, can everyone hear me? 
Yes. You're a little low, but I can hear you. Okay, okay, perfect. Uh, a bit more closer. Uh, okay, perfect. So, yes, this week we do have the distribution week of the Broward Bike Map 2021. These are great news. We launched the Bike Map, the virtual version, a few months ago, but now uh, just to let everyone know, all the agencies interested in having a printed version of the map, you can uh, go uh, this week to the office. Benjamin Restrepo, uh, if you can raise your hand. Perfect. Benjamin Restrepo will be at the office and he will be uh, delivering the map together with the PIO team, Hannah and Kyra Everett. They will be there as well. But if you want, the direct contact is Benjamin Restrepo. If you want to uh, maybe schedule a specific time from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. or 4 p.m. to 6 p.m., please email him. He is the person to contact to. Um, also, if you want to uh, maybe uh, be a little bit proactive, you can scan the code right now and have access to the bike map. This is the virtual version. You can share the bike map with everyone that you think would be helpful. And I think we can go to the next slide. Perfect. So I think everyone is waiting for an update. We've been working uh, with the city of Deerfield Beach for a few months now, since March 2021. And right now we, we, we want to tell you that uh, we created this story map. You can also scan the QR code with your smartphone and have access to um, a little uh, and quick overview of what we have been doing with the city of Deerfield. This story map has all the information, you know, it has an overview while we are doing this. It also have a timeline of the project that I'll be sharing in a little while. It also has, you know, what exactly are the elements that we are considering into implementation for this specific corridor that is Northeaster Avenue from Sample Road to Northeast 44th Street. And it also has some information about the partnership. And of course we have more news coming up for this project that we hopefully will uh, announce uh, by the end of the month. But there are great opportunities. And if we go to the next slide. Thank you, Amanda. Um, this is the timeline of the project. As you can see right now, we are in summer 2021, the phase of public outreach. The first meeting was held in June 5th. It was a first public outreach meeting in order to understand what exactly are the needs of the corridor coming from the residents of the area. And now we are going to host a second workshop on August 26th at 6 p.m. If you want to attend, it's in person. Uh, the idea is to present a conceptual design after you know hearing what the community has to say and all the other stakeholders. Uh, we have a, a design right now. It's under review uh, by the county and the city staff. So if you want to uh, you know be part of the process. Uh, please attend this workshop. We will provide more information soon, a registration link. After the, the, the design, after we finalize this design, the idea is that by fall um, 2021, we will have a final design, right? And then we will implement this project in November 2021. It also, if you want to be a part of the process as a volunteer, you want to paint with us, just let us know because we have uh, many volunteering uh, opportunities for everyone at Pinstack. And uh, of course, after implementation, we will have a uh, data collection in order to let everyone know, you know, how is it going and how many pedestrians and cyclists are using the corridor as well, how the drivers are interacting with the new design. And then of course, we will have a report that will be ready by December and we will continue monitoring the data. Uh, so hopefully we will have more news uh, by the end of the year you know, a second call for project, but uh, we are pretty excited about this. And of course we are thankful, thankful with the city of Deerfield Beach because they've been a re great partner. Um, and I think that's it for now. Uh, thank you so much. You're welcome, Stephanie. And, and th this is Stephanie's information, contact information in case um, you need to write it down. She is a font of knowledge, as I've said before. Um, and next, Mr. Fazal Qureshi will be doing um, the mobility projects update. And Fazal, as I can, as I go through the slides, just let me know when you want me to advance. Okay.
Sure. Uh, uh, sounds good. Um, uh, today, I'm going to present on the Mobility Projects Fiscal 21 Overview. And as Amanda has stated, uh, my name is Fazal Kershi. I'm uh, part of the Broward MPO as a project manager. Uh, next. Just uh, very briefly, I'm just going to go over the implementation process before, uh, be before we start talking about where all these projects um, ended up at the end of this past fiscal year. But um, just very quickly, uh, in order for any of our projects to to receive funding, they have to become program ready. And then once a project is program ready, they they have the opportunity to be funded in the fifth year of the upcoming FDOT work program. So from the programming stage all the way to the end of construction is roughly uh, nine to ten years. Um, the one phase or the the one activity that I want to highlight really briefly is the third year check. Um, in these uh, past two years, we have. We have we have started this uh, initiative initiative that we call the 30 year MPO check where we meet with FDOT and then also with the local municipalities to verify the scope and it also gives us an opportunity to ensure that the scope that to ensure that the scope that FDOT has also matches what the initial intent of the scope was and then to also ensure that those that the city does have any other projects that are that are conflicting with our project corridor and then to also make sure that all the existing conditions as previously um, programmed are 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 still the same uh, next um, as a, as a many of you all know uh, this past year during the COVID pandemic, we started this new educational messaging uh, campaign on our various social media platforms. Uh, this is just one example of a social media post that we put out for for one of our on for one of our projects that were ongoing in construction. So um, what we have been doing about every month, we've been sending out different uh, construction progress pictures. Uh, uh, this one is North 14th Avenue. It this post will provide you the, the scope of the project. It'll also provide you the activities that are going on in the uh, progress picture. It'll also provide the construction completion date. And we also provide a short synopsis of the benefits of, of these improvements. Uh, next. Currently right now we have four projects that have that that had not started um, design this at the, at the at the end of uh, fiscal year 21. Um, there are these projects that you see on the screen, the Hollywood or the 429576-9 project and the last two projects on University Drive. We are currently actually going through the whole MPO 30 year check with these municipalities uh, for these projects where we're, we're receiving resolutions of support and those municipalities are going to be conducting uh, some public outreach to the residents. Um, Two things I want to highlight really quick on this table is a production date and the letting date. Uh, you're also going to see the production date and the letting date on the on the next few slides. But the production date is when the design will be completed, and then the letting date is when the contractor will be awarded the project. and And it's a good as and it's and it's a good assumption to assume that the project will uh, break ground about three months, three to four months after the letting date. Uh, next. At the end of fiscal year 21, um, we ended up having 19 projects that were still in the design phase. Uh, some of these projects did complete their, their production complete um, deadlines. However, they, they were not uh, advertised for construction as of yet. Uh, can you go to the next slide? And then uh, these are some of our other projects. As you can see, there's projects all over the, the county. There, there are still some projects that still have not that still have not been programmed for construction. That's why you see underneath some of these letting columns that there that there isn't a month and a year uh, for these projects. But hopefully, in in the in the next new in the next TIP, these projects will have a construction year. Uh, next, I'm just going to briefly go over a few projects that we that we have been able to accomplish some really great things in design. Um, these two projects on our screen are, are along University Drive. One is along Miramar, and the other one is in is in uh, City of Plantation. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go I'll go over the City of Plantation one really briefly. That's a project that's on the right. 
uh, or originally planned, we were we were just going to be installing some central buffer bike lanes and some minor sidewalk improvements. But with the help with, with the help of City of Plantation and, and a law court and a law coordination between FTT and the City of Plantation, um, we found out or we decided to uh, to propose a 10 foot shared use path on the west side instead of instead of putting some sidewalk on the east side and. One reason for this was all the major destinations are along the west side, like Broward Mall, and in the in, in the in the other outlet that's that's over there. Um, we were also able to incorporate some transit amenity improvements, uh, pedestrian lighting, some roadway lighting enhancements, uh, ADA improvements, and in the project along um, or or the project in Miramar, we were able to to do many of those same type of improvements. Um, with the inclusion of adding a pedestrian bridge that crossed the canal that's on the east side uh, for from the communities on the east side to be able to access University Drive. And we also were able to connect connect our wide shared use path or wide sidewalk uh, to a park on the south side of um, University Drive near Riviera, near Riviera Boulevard. Uh, next. Um, these are just some, some uh, some images of some of the improvements, such as the buffer bike lanes, the pedestrian lighting on the existing light poles, uh, the transit amenity improvements, and the wide shared use path. Uh, next. Another project uh, that we want to highlight is the Copens Road project. Um, this project, we were able to successfully implement a, a completely separated bicycle lane uh, facility. Um, for this project, we were able to work with the city of Coconut Creek, with Broward County, and with DOT to, to, to implement this very transformative you know, design. Uh, this will be one of the first um, completely separated bike lane facilities in Broward County. And, and we hope that this project will become the new normal, hopefully in the future. And there's also some other types of constraints uh, uh, related to some of our other projects um, such as right away and whatnot, but this project was a perfect location to implement this type of improvement. Uh, next. So, so currently in construction, um, we actually only have five projects that are that are that are currently in construction. However, a lot of the projects from design, some of those 19 projects will be moving into the construction phase uh, this year. Um, as you can see, some of our Projects have many segments. As you can see, the one on the screen, this is just one project. I believe there's 11 different uh, segments where there's different types of improvements being done. Uh, next. And then these are some of our other ones. Um, and one and, and, and two of these projects actually just started recently, which, which is the Coral Ridge Drive project, which started right before uh, the, uh, the fiscal year ended. Uh, next. Uh, one project in particular that I'm just going to highlight really briefly is the North North 56th Avenue project. Uh, this project is roughly two two and a half miles. Um, we are we are implementing uh, seven foot buffered bike lanes through this corridor, as as well as filling in some sidewalk gaps. We are also doing some some ADA improvements. We are um, fixing some existing sidewalk sidewalk ADA deficient areas. Uh, but this project is going to completely transform this corridor and 56 Avenue will also connect with many of our other projects that we have already built or or that we have proposed in the future. So it's going to so it's going to create a nice little network of bike lanes and sidewalks. Next. All right, so um, I'm very happy to announce that that our Tiger projects are in construction now. Um, and if and if you're not aware what the what what our tiger projects are, it was a, a grant that was awarded to the to the MPO in, in 2016. Uh, we were able to partner with uh, FGT, Broward County, Fort Lauderdale, Pompano Beach, Open Park, and Lauderdale Lakes to to help um, get this project um, awarded. And the total project cost of this tiger project is 21.4 million dollars. Um, all of our partners, each and every one of our partners contributed uh, funds for this project um, to, to ensure that we're able to implement and we're able to um, build everything that, that, 
that met the needs of all of these communities in, in these various municipalities. Uh, next. All right, so um, this past year, we were able to complete 12 different construction projects all over the county. Uh, can you go next really quick? Um, as you can see on here as well, there's there's projects almost all around Broward County. There's in, even many projects that are better within the same, uh, same city even, but we were able to build 12 different projects for approximately $50 million. Uh, next. Um, this is a one great project, uh, Northwest 21st Avenue from Oakland Park Boulevard to Commercial Boulevard. Um, we were able to install uh, seven foot buffer bike lanes, do some sidewalk enhancements throughout this corridor. And due to our improvements, we were able to million service service the whole road. Uh, we even widened the bridge to ensure that we have a continuous buffered bike lane throughout the corridor. Uh, next. Another great project we finished was uh, Rock Island Road from Sample to Wiles. Um, this project, we were we were able to, you know, incorporate a, a bike lane, but we were also able to build a sidewalk underneath the existing, you know, shade trees um, through the corridor. And 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 this project with, with a lot of help from uh, Cedar Coral Springs and the Turtle Creek CRA or Turtle Creek Improvement District. Um, uh, uh, we were able to partner together to 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 really help um, provide some of these needed facilities. Next, and last but not least, uh, Prospect Road. Uh, Prospect Road is completed now. Um, uh, Prospect Road extended from Commercial Boulevard all the way to Dixie Highway. However, between Powerline Road and Dixie Highway, we actually did a lane elimination, and through the through the extra, um, uh, for the extra pavement, uh, we were able to install a seven foot, seven foot continuous green buffered bike lanes, as well as some bulb outs. Um, and as part of the Prospect Road project, as well as the Northwest 21st Avenue project, a city of Oakland Park and Broward County are working together to come back and install some landscaping in the future. Next. All right, um, this is just a short summary of where all of our projects were at the end of fiscal year 21. Uh, for, for, for all these projects, the dollar amounts are actually the committed construction amounts or the projected construction amounts. It just depends if the project was funded yet or not. Uh, next. And, and I'm excited to say that we were able to build 11 miles of sidewalks this past year, as well as 20 miles of bike lanes. Next. All right. Um, and and once again, my name is Basil Kershey, and uh, and that concludes my presentation. And if anyone has any questions related to these projects, uh, feel free to reach out. Thank you, Fazal. Um, I'm going to offer you another chance to look at the Mentimeter code before we continue on to our main presentations. And our first presentation will be Mr. Tim Stanbury, and he'll be discussing the move over driver removal laws. And Mr. Stanbury, as you want me to advance the slides, just please let me know. Sure. Did we want to start with that first uh, Minty thing? Are they going to do that? The question? Um, to begin? We can. Sure. The first yeah. question. Sure. Hold yeah, on I, think, just a uh, I think that's kind of how it's set up today. So. Okay. I'm do that. I believe your first question is has to do with the presentation that I'm going to be showing today uh, to cover some of the move over law and driver removal laws. But the question is, were you familiar with the move over law before today's presentation? And so we've got uh, at least four of you that have never heard of it or don't know it at all. And there's some that are familiar and obey with it. So for those of you that are familiar with it and obey with it, uh, I'm glad you understand as the numbers continue to climb. I'm glad to see that. Uh, but it's not just okay that you understand it. I hope that you'll help educate others because there are way, way too many people that don't understand what this law is. And so as we go through this presentation today, I hope you'll take some of the information I'm gonna hand out to you, share it with others, everyone from members of your family, you know, uh, neighbors, other citizens that you know, so that we can keep our responders safe while they're out there on the job. So 
I appreciate that. Thank you for doing that. And there'll be another survey when we're finished. So thanks, man. If you'll go to the slide for the presentation, we'll begin to roll right into it. Um, I'm going to start off with a quick introduction of myself. My name is Tim Stanbury. I'm the District Force Traffic Incident Management Coordinator here in North Fort Lauderdale. I am responsible for traffic incident management activities up and down the coastline, everywhere from um, Broward all the way up to Palm Beach into the Treasure Coast. Uh, I also, in addition to uh, some of the responsibilities of the programs that I help operate are the Road Ranger program that assists motorists and our rapid incident scene clearance. And then uh, last but not least, uh, I do traffic incident management training for a lot of our first responders. I'm a master trainer. So when uh, we go out to do stuff, we do everything we can to educate our first responders to keep them safe when they go out and play in traffic and have to clear up traffic incidents so you're not inconvenienced as motorists or those professionals that they're out there using the roadways. However, we do have a lot of situations in which we need help from the public because the laws are put in place and regardless of how well we train people, there are many times that folks aren't obeying the laws or they're, they're kind of ignorant of the laws. And so my presentation today, hopefully we'll clear that up, but it's kind of, uh, I've got some videos in here. And when I show these, uh, we're gonna try to have a good time with this because I do this a lot. So I, will, I like to enjoy myself when I'm working, but please don't think if we joke around that this isn't serious business because it is life, so kind of depending on it. Uh, next slide I want to start off and hopefully it'll play well here is a public uh, safety announcement that kind of shows all the different stuff that I'm going to be talking about. Can you roll that for us, Amanda? Was everyone able to see that video? Yeah, we saw it. I mean, I just couldn't hear it very well. It was a little low. It's a little but... soft. If you want to yeah. play a little louder, Amanda, I think. I'm trying. Oh. It's playing as loud as I can. Amanda, what you need to do is you need to reshare your screen. And in the bottom right hand corner or the left hand corner, it says share with sound. Okie dokie. Um, just give me a second. I'm sorry for the technical, sure, no, you're fine. technical you difficulties hey, on my part. I've done this presentation for about 15 groups now. And every time we do something, there's always a little something that goes on. So we're all, I think we're all getting used to it. Don't, no sweat, Amanda. Okay. We get, the, we get the message across. It'll be well worth it. Okay. And you're seeing the firefighters, correct? Uh, right now, we just see you. Okay. Firefighters? Yes. There we go. Thank you. What is it you think we're doing? 24 hours a day, emergency services personnel work hard to save lives and make our roads safer. Please give us room to work slow down because it's no picnic out here. In point one miles, turn right. What the? Recalculating. Don't step into traffic. Huh? Move the car off the road. It's safer. I gotta let my insurance company. They'll say the same. I'll call them. No, no. Move it. I'm sorry. If you have a minor accident, are not seriously injured, and your car is drivable, then move it. Passing a vehicle crash? Keep your eyes on the traffic. Leave your phone alone. No photos, no video, no social media posting. Respect the victims, protect the responders, and save yourself. Leave your phone alone.
Thanks, Amanda. If you go to the next slide, please. So today, one of the things that I want to talk about first and foremost is the move over law. As you can see from the, the PSAs that we run, we average anywhere between seven to 10 responders that arrive to a scene of a crash. And while they're out there trying to do their job, if we don't slow down, move over, the chances of them getting struck greatly increase. And unfortunately, around the nation, we've had over 30 responders already killed this year alone. That's not counting the ones that are just seriously injured. We've had two since February in District 4 that have been struck with serious injuries. One of them is, is in the hospital right now going through some really serious stuff. And the other one will probably never be able to uh, respond as a road ranger. So it's real important that we get the information out so that everyone understands that when you see lights and you see people on the road that there's actually action that you must take. I wanna show you some of the things because I can sit here and preach all day long to you. But when you see some of the things that occur to our responders on the road that actually happen, it kind of makes you stop and think. So the next slide, please. So this is a police officer who was, as I set this up, he was, and you can go ahead and roll it, Amanda. He was actually doing training with another officer and there was an officer behind him that was actually able to catch us on his dash cam. Most of the officers put their brief, their briefcases and stuff in the back seat uh, when they have someone riding along because it's usually in their passenger seat. And as he goes into the back to get his briefcase to document some training, a motorist that failed to slow down and pull over struck him. He was very fortunate that he actually was able to get up and get away. That could have been tragic. He could have lost his life. And these are the kind of the incidents that unfortunately we see far too often. Next slide, please. I think it's, there you go. This is another one that happened in uh, Dayton, Ohio. Uh, there was a, just a minor crash on a two lane road. You can see it's raining, conditions aren't real good. The responder was actually taking the time to talk to the person in the vehicle. I think it was another responder on scene. He was explaining what was going on. And as he's doing this, there's not a lot of good traffic control set up. And the drivers that were driving weren't paying attention. Uh, too often times we have people with what I like to say, they have their head up their apps, they're either on their phone or they're just you know, looking at stuff. And you'll see what happens here has this driver just right, right through their scene. Um, and the guy came, you know, the trooper came within a, a few feet of probably losing his life. And I try to tell everybody when you're out there driving a vehicle, when you're working alongside the road, you come within about three feet of death every time you're out there. And it's a scary proposition to try to make a living. And I jokingly say, you know, if you were in the back of that ambulance and you were getting stuck with an IV or worse yet, you're getting a catheter stuck in you, the last thing you'd want someone crashing in the back of your ambulance. And so we encourage the folks to do what they need to do and get off scene quickly. But we need the public's cooperation so that when we're out there working, we can have a safe environment to work in. And uh, as you can see, that could have been another situation that was very tragic. Next slide, please. So officers have to oftentimes stop and you'll look here, he's how close he is to the edge line. And when people don't slow down and move over, mm. they get struck. And we teach for them to do passenger side approaches now, but as you can see, this video is from 08. And this is the kind of thing that for off, oftentimes that they're within that, in that danger zone, within a few feet of death. Next video, please. This is a, a guy that's having a really bad day. You can see he's already, you know, done something wrong in which uh, an officer is having to apprehend him. They've got him in cuffs. We've got two officers on scene. They're in an area of what we call the, the kill zone. They're standing between two vehicles so that if someone hits one of the back of the vehicles, they'll get pinned or trapped, may even lose a leg. And this guy's day is gonna get significantly worse as he's being patted down for paraphernalia. And even with the officer trying to watch traffic, you see somebody didn't slow down, move over, and look how quickly that escalated. Next slide, please. So we put the move over law in place because these kind of incidents happen each and every day. And what the move over law actually does, it requires drivers when they're approaching a scene with emergency vehicles, and it can be any emergency vehicle. It can be anything from a tow truck, police officer, fire, EMS, uh, a DOT worker. Recently, they passed legislation in the state that now can, all our construction workers are covered, but it could be a garbage truck in your local neighborhood. When you approach those vehicles with their lights on, they're trying to make a living, trying to respond to something on the side of the road, you're required by law to slow down to 20 miles below the posted speed limit. And if you're on a roadway that the speed limit is 20 miles or less, you're to slow down to five miles an hour. And by doing this, it gives our folks a chance to make a living, to be able to go home safe at the end of each and every day. And that's kind of the goal. We want, you know, 
I jokingly have told people my father-in-law was a barber for 50 years and I once asked him if he wouldn't mind slowing down when we saw one of our workers when he was driving and I was with him and he asked me why and I said well I need to slow down and move over first off because the law second of all those are people I work with I don't want to get struck and I said you know no one drives through your barber shop and when you're out there trying to cut hair and that's their office that's their shop they're working on the side of the road so we just ask that people slow down and move over next slide please now if you don't want to do it because I suggest you want to do it or because you can read the statute there it is a statute and if you don't want to slow down, they can't, you can't be cited for it because it is a Florida statute and it is a ticketable offense. Next slide, please. Ideally, if you can't slow down, uh, we understand there are certain situations, but on top, if you click the advance the slide, you'll see that the ideal is for the truck to actually move over a lane like it did in the picture. And that's ideal because you see there's plenty of room. They have a whole lane width, about 12 foot, plus the shoulder to work with. Uh, below, you'll notice we have three lanes of traffic and there's cars in every lane. So sometimes you just can't move over because of traffic, but you still can slow down. So when you see those lights, give us a break and slow down. Next slide, please. So around the nation, we developed, uh, for about the last 10 years or so, we have had a national TIM training program in which we go out and train responders. Some of the things that I'm talking to you about today that helps them. And we focus on responder safety, safe quick clearance, prompt uh, inter uh, operable communications between all the folks that are involved in, in a traffic crash. And in order to do that, those are our objectives. And so we're working as fast and efficiently as possible to, and safely to get off the roadway so that you can get to where you wanna go. But we need your help because too often times we find ourselves in situations where we are just within a few feet of death. Next slide, please. And here's an example. This gentleman, we're working a scene. Uh, and they're in Dayton, Ohio. Once again, there's a crash that occurred. Anytime we have a crash at one location, there's the chance that you're gonna have a secondary crash. That's what happened here. The road wasn't treated. Uh, icy conditions, there's no traffic control, no advance warning. They're just basically trying to respond. We have responders on both sides of the roadway. And if you'll pay attention to the captain on the left side of your screen, he's trying to see what's going on in the secondary crash. And if you don't do something different, you're just gonna keep repeating something that's happened. And in this case, as he pokes his head around, we're about to have a tertiary crash in which one of those drivers just slow down and move over. And you see him get struck. Uh, he broke his legs. He had punctured lungs, broke his ribs. Uh, very fortunate that um, a police officer who was sitting in his vehicle, in which his dash cam video was shot from, responded and they were able to get him help because the people on his own crew didn't even realize that he'd been struck. And so you see how fast, uh, just trying to help us, uh, you know, we're trying to help the folks that have something bad. It may be the worst they've ever had. We're out there trying to do something about it and try to keep them safe. We got to keep traffic moving. And then unfortunately, people don't slow down or move over. And then those are the kind of things that happen. Next slide, please. So oftentimes, uh, as we're out there, the road conditions can be bad. So if you don't slow down, you can lose control of your vehicle. And this is exactly what happened to the semi. It lost control of the vehicle and ran into the fire truck. And then the poor responders were you know, had to make a quick decision, what do we do? In this case, they actually jumped over the median wall, which is a great idea if you have plenty of room and a shoulder on the other side, but what happens if we're working, you know, on a bridge or there's an expansion between the two? And you'll see how quickly, despite the fact that that fire truck's blocking the scene, the vehicle moves a little bit and it causes the, the driver to have to evacuate the building and the people that were on the ground to actually go over the wall. And it's scary because they have very little time to react when those kind of things happen. And, you know, those are mothers, fathers, uh, sons, daughters, your next door neighbor, they're friends of ours, they're coworkers. And so we want them to give a chance to, to make a living, but go home safe every day. Next slide, please. Officers uh, approach stuff. Sometimes they make some mistakes on their own. You'll see there's a lot of green space over on the right-hand side. This officer chose to still do a driver's side approach, which we do not teach anymore. Uh, and as he's talking, there's a, to the young lady, I don't know if she's going to get a ticket or what, but there was somebody running late for the airport. They were in a hurry. Uh, and this happens far too often. They got too close. And within, like I said, three feet, three or four feet, he gets struck. Uh, he continues to try to call stuff in, but for a moment there, he was stunned and he still stood right next to the side of the road. And then on the next slide, you're going to see that 
we we actually teach the police officers now to be on the passenger side. We want something between them and traffic. So now he can turn and look and he can see anything coming. So as a car comes off the road, he's able to safely run away. And as a matter of fact, he's still running. So if any of you guys see him, let us know because we're looking for him. He just said he was done for that. But no, <laughs> but seriously, you know, too often times these are the kind of things that happen when you're out there just trying to make a living. You know, it looks like a routine and we, I, you know, when I teach the class for traffic incident management, I tell them there's no such thing as a routine incident or routine day on the job. Things can happen really bad, especially in the world we live in now where everybody's doing everything except focusing on driving. Next slide, please. So there are some other laws. It was kind of mentioned in the PSA that we did earlier, uh, driver removal laws. They kind of go hand in hand because as you see the crashes that occur, oftentimes we'll have a secondary crash. And the driver removal law is known different names around the nation, but it pretty much is the same thing. It's either a fender bender or a move it law or a steer clear law. And what it does, it requires motorists, if you're involved in a non-injury motor vehicle crash and the car can be moved to remove the vehicle from the travel lanes. And that can be to the shoulder or to a safer location completely off the roadway. A lot of folks, especially older folks like me, were taught when we first started driving, do not move your vehicle when you're involved in a crash. They think that Jake from State Farm is going to come out there wearing his khakis and say who's at fault. And that is not how this works. Police officers are going to show up. They're going to take each person's driver's license, their information, their insurance, exchange it, write a report, give you a copy of the report. And then the insurance companies are going to battle it out later on. So for the safety of you, the motorist, so that you're not staying outside your vehicle, getting struck, the safety of our responders who have to respond, and the safety of the motorists that are approaching that crash, we're going to ask you to move your vehicle because it is the law. Next slide, please. And you will see there's actually the statute. And if you fail to do that and you're obstructed to move your vehicle and you don't do it, you can be cited. And we don't want that to happen. So we wanna make sure everyone's safe and can get to where they're going, but we wanna do it safely. Next slide, please. So we also have some authority removal laws that say that for some reason there's like spilled cargo on the road or if a vehicle is in a position in which it's blocking traffic for whatever reason, the Department of Transportation or authorized representatives can move it if it's gonna cause serious injury or harm to somebody else. And we can do that without being sued or held, or held accountable. And it's implemented in, in almost all the states around the United States. And basically it's like, hey, if you know, because you spilt your wine bottles on the road does not give you a reason to hold up traffic forever. If we have to, we're gonna push it and move it out of the way. And once again, if you go to the next slide, that is an actual uh, you know, authority removal as a statute. And we can do that and we will do that because we don't want to cause those secondary crashes. Or, you know, if you have that nice Mercedes and it's blocking, it could get somebody killed. You know, we'd rather scratch your car by moving it out of the way than have it kill somebody. So next slide, please. And then we'll do that as you'll see in this uh, picture, you notice there's a couple of vehicles. So what we can do is we can actually push, pull or drag them out of the roadway because we don't want a vehicle, in this case, it's facing the wrong direction of traffic. Uh, you see the sign up there, high school road, which means there's gotta be a school close by. We don't want when children are being picked up or young drivers that are driving to and from school to have to make decisions because they usually make the wrong decision when they're in the middle of the intersection. You see the conditions of the road are bad, it's slick, it's raining. And so the last, you know, last thing we want is responders on the scene when another vehicle can come along and lose control. So what we'll do is we'll push, pull, or drag those vehicles out of the way and work them from a safer location off the side of the road. Doesn't mean we're going to drive it. You know, I'm not going to take off and go to Tupelo, Mississippi or anything, but I can push that thing and it will slide on that pavement. Next slide, please. So here's an example of how we do that. Uh, there's a car broken down on what we call lane one or the fast lane, the inside lane there. The, uh, rather than call a tow truck and wait you know, for it to get there and have to fight its way through all that traffic queue, We'll actually hold traffic. We'll explain to the driver what we're gonna do. We use the push bumpers. In this case, they did it from a law enforcement vehicle. They'll push the vehicle across the lanes of traffic over to that wide shoulder on the right. And once the vehicle is safely over there, the officers will hustle back into their vehicle. And then, you know, they've let traffic, told traffic to please hold for a moment. And that's the hardest part is getting them to stop and not go because people kind of want to do what they want to do. And once we do that, we can actually open up the travel lanes and drivers can continue to go. And then it reduces the chance we'll have a secondary crash and we're able to quickly clear the lanes. And a tow truck now has plenty of room to operate without having to be in the middle of traffic. Next slide, please. 
And so this is an example of just the folks doing it, some pictures. So we can do it from the push bumpers that you see. Sometimes we'll go out and manually push it and we'll teach them as long as it doesn't violate any workers comp or anything that's gonna get them you know, hurt that we'll safely push, pull or drag vehicles out of the roadway so that we can open up the travel lanes and prevent those secondary crashes or responders being struck having to work an incident in the travel lanes. Next slide, please. So I wanna leave you with a little a reminder of our PSA here. So See emergency this. lights? Move over, slow down, remain alert, give responders room to work. Move over, slow down. And so now the challenge See for emerge and every one of you is to go out and take the information that you've learned today and hopefully share it with others. So we do have another survey question here. So if uh, Amanda wants to forward that to the next survey question, we'll be glad to take that on. And so after your presentation today, uh, will you, and it's give you some choices there, to either obey the move over law and encourage others to do the same. And hopefully everyone's gonna do that because uh, we got lives dependent on it. And some of those are coworkers or they may be your friends, it may be you know, a loved one. And uh, we tell everybody the goal every day is we go to work is to survive the day to go home safe because we're trying to help you and we can't help you if we get hurt ourselves. So I wanna thank you for uh, your time and attention today. And I hope that you've enjoyed the presentation, but more, and more importantly, I hope that you'll remember to slow down and move over when you can, or if you're involved in a crash, that you remember to move your vehicle from the travel lanes so that we can safely get you to where you wanna go, but get others safe as well. And if you have any questions, my contact information isn't part of this. Uh, I work with Jody Mendez, who's our DOT trap, uh, incident management program manager. And we're always uh, ready to help anyone, whether it's outreach to the public or our first responders and the people that we train. So I thank you for your time and attention and I hope you enjoyed today's presentation. Thank, thank you, you Amanda. Thank you, Tim. It looks like um, Ricardo has a question. I do sure. have a question. Thank you, sure. Tim. Hi, Great Ricardo. Hi, good, good afternoon. Thank you. Great presentation, very powerful. Have you seen a reduction in uh, incidents since you, I guess, started with the move with the move over law? Uh, the move over law, oddly enough, has been around since about 2004. It started in South Carolina after a tow truck driver was struck. So all 50 states have it. Um, it's hard to tell whether or not there's a reduction because we have there's so many different factors. We have a lot more incidents now because we have a lot more traffic now. Uh, you know, so we don't know the impact that it's having uh, as far as like the numbers, the numbers don't prove it out. And so that's why we each year we have a national responder week in which we try to get the word out for people to slow down and to move over and to keep all our responders safe. And we're hoping to drive down. But but for example, on the average year, we have had about 38 responders struck and killed around the nation from the groups that report to us already this year we've had over 30 so oh. and we're just now halfway through the year so i would say no uh, we still have way too many people who are on their phones uh, you know they need to pull their head out of their apps not be on their phone they need to be paying attention when they're driving i've seen everybody from cooking meals uh, we've had women breastfeeding their children we had people, I mean, it's some of the most outrageous stuff you've ever seen happens when people are behind the wheel of a vehicle. Everyone thinks that it's important to multitask and they don't realize that when you're behind the wheel of a vehicle, you and everyone else on the roadways been a few feet of death. And here in Florida, I, you know, we have everything. I want you to think about this for just a moment. We have developing drivers, which are kids learning to drive. We have people who aren't from the United States because it's so easy to come to Florida and it's such a great place to live that they come here because it, it's, a, it's an awesome opportunity, but they're not familiar with all the laws. They're not familiar with how we operate on the roads. They're not even familiar with the area. And then last but not least, we have what I like to call the distinguished drivers. There are a lot, there's a lot of our population here who are a little on the older side. Some of them maybe even shouldn't be driving a vehicle anymore. And yet they're out there operating amongst everybody else. And you have everything from people you know, playing Grand Theft Auto on the roadway going 95 to the, you know, people like me that are blue haired driving along at 45. And so we want, you know, we want to keep everybody safe, whether you're a motorist or if you're an emergency responder. 
And that's a great question. I would love to say that, yes, it's making a difference, but it hasn't yet. And that's why I do this, is we've got to get the word out and we have to make a difference. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you for the question. Are there others? I just have a statement to make. Um, sure. I have been driving a very long time. I did not know about this law. I was driving on 95 North in West Palm Beach, did not move over, got a ticket. And that was about four months ago. And I told Buffy about this um, and I, I had no idea. So, well, Amanda, I'm sorry that you got a ticket because I know what that's like when you get a ticket, but I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that officers, number one, enforce the law. Number yep. two, that the message is out and you will probably tell more people because you got to tell everybody about, <laughs> about, and that helps us get the word out. But I'm even more grateful that someone wasn't hurt because you didn't fail to slow down and move over. Yep. So thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, if not, thank you again for your time and attention. I appreciate it. And don't forget, share that move over law and the other laws with everybody, kids, parents, neighbors, friends, you got it. Yep. We sure do. Thank you. Thank you. And we do have one. Um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Stephanie. Sorry. I do have a question. Is oh. there any, any way for a team to, for example, partner with municipalities in order to spread the word? Or is, is DOT already working with the municipalities in order to inform the residents? Yeah, I think if I understood you, Stephanie, is you're kind of wanting to know, is there outreach? Uh, are we doing this sort of thing? So um i'm open to speaking to any group i can if it's going to keep people safe okay this is probably the most important thing i do is keep our responders safe you know that's the only thing i uh lose sleep at night about is wondering if we did everything we can to keep people safe we do have the psas we do have uh, we actually take one week of the year in which we work with our public information officers we get information out through the high patrol as well as through the dot uh getting stuff out we try to get a hold of media that we have some groups actually working on trying to do some more things. We've actually put some advertisements out with the radio and the people that do traffic. Uh, we have signs posted everywhere. Uh, we, you know, we do a lot of different things. I've actually spoke to all the community traffic safety all the way up and down for district four. Uh, I've been to every one of their safety meetings uh, in, in May and we brief this information out to them, but there's always opportunities to improve. And if, there, if you know of a chance or whatever, my contact information is there, let me know. That's kind of how Buffy got a hold of me and, we, and I showed up today is because I'm going to be doing more town halls with our DOT people mm -hmm. as well as other stuff. So I'll be glad to share this information with whoever will take the time to listen and uh, because it could be you that's, that's impacted by it. So great question, Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you so much, team. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. And our next presentation, Erica Lychek um, will be, she's our communications um, manager and our Title VI uh, coordinator. She'll be doing a presentation about transportation planning, the equity assessment tool. And again, Erica, as you would like for me to advance the slides, please just let me know. Perfect, thank you, Amanda. Good afternoon, everyone. Certainly a pleasure to be here. And yeah, I am Erica Lychak and I manage our communications and outreach team, but here today to chat with you about something that is um, really interesting, kind of really a, a one of a kind um, tool resource, if you want to call it that, that we've probably spent, I would say at this point, we're working on about three and a half years worth of work at the MPO. And certainly something that I'm going to be presenting to you kind of today through the lens of, you know, public engagement or public involvement, but this resource really is something that is gonna run the gamut and has a lot of different kind of uh, uses and ways to utilize. So next slide, please, Amanda. So quickly, I just wanna take you through the presentation sort of topic, the way we're gonna structure it. I'm gonna give you a little bit of historical context because again, some people know about Title VI and, and what is required and others don't. So we're gonna sort of you know high level look at that. I wanna chat with you about the equity assessment overview, the resource itself, and then really about equity and engagement and what it means to go out into the communities. And you know, once you have this information, how you can really apply it in a meaningful way. Next slide, please. So the first thing I do wanna differentiate between is equity and equality. You're gonna hear these two terms a lot kind of in, in this realm that we're dealing with. And I do wanna also point out that with our new administration in, you know, in Washington 
equity has really been um, a topic that is receiving a lot of attention, a lot of focus. Uh, there's specifically an executive order that was issued by President Biden that requires government agencies to find a way to address equity, specifically in underserved communities and underserved populations. So I am certainly not the first, nor will I be the last person that you're going to hear from telling you equity is something that's very, very important. And in the realm of transportation, you know, even more so. So again, you can see the graphic here when equality implies that we treat everyone the same regardless of their experience. And I really love this graphic because it's something that's super visual. So as you can see, you have folks of different ages, different sizes and different abilities, but everyone's being given the same bicycle. Whereas equity is focusing on providing the same opportunities for the advancement of all individuals. So here, it's obvious that you know a, a man who's six foot four is gonna need a different bicycle than a child or someone in a wheelchair. And so it's the idea that again, we wanna be finding ways to promote equity, that same opportunity and advancement for all individuals. Next slide, please. Now we're gonna talk a little bit obviously about equity and transportation. And transportation planning decisions really do have significant equity impacts. And quality of available transportation choices directly impacts you know, ac um, economic prosperity through access to jobs, social opportunities, healthcare, recreation, and even housing. So transportation is really an important part of everyone's everyday life. It's also an expense that can be a high share of you know, an annual household's expenses. And decisions that relate to transportation and where transportation is placed or planned uh, do, again, affect housing, land values, as well as jobs. Next slide, please, Amanda. Now, this is a little bit of that historical context that I was talking about. So the traditional approaches to equity. Well, Title VI was an executive order, and it came out of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and it prohibits discrimination based on race, color, or national origin in programs or activities that receive federal assistance. Now, the Title VI program in general that came out of this um, executive order or this act has some objectives. And one of them is that ensuring the level and quality of public transportation services provided in a non-discriminatory manner uh, that promote to promote full and fair participation in public transportation decision-making without regards to race, color, or national origin and the last is to ensure meaningful access to transit related programs and activities by persons with limited English proficiency. Now, I know that that's a lot of kind of official sounding language, but basically, as the Broward MPO, we are an agency that receives federal assistance. You know, those federal funds are then obviously distributed throughout the region. And as such, we are responsible for adhering to a Title VI program. So next slide, please, Amanda. Perfect, there we go. Again, when we're talking historical context, something else that I, I like to bring up whenever we're talking about um, equity is environmental justice, because you hear a lot about Title VI and environmental justice often in the same kind of conversation. And oftentimes the two, um, I think get uh, conflated. And they sometimes, and it's important, I think, to just understand the way that they're different, but then the ways that they really are similar. So environmental justice is something that came out of an executive order, and it seeks to ensure that decisions made by government agencies do not result in a disproportionate burden or harm to low income and minority populations. So the executive order on, around environmental justice is really about the effects and the harm that might be done when certain decisions or certain things are implemented or not. Next slide, please. So equity in transportation is kind of a big uh, topic to tackle, but I've provided two um, visuals that are kind of the extreme ends of when we're talking about equity in transportation. It can be very macro and it can be very micro. So the, the uh, picture that you're going to see, which is to my left, is Overtown. And Overtown is a really terrible example, but one that we often look to when talking about equity and the effects of really ignoring those underserved populations. You had a very thriving, active Amer African American community in Miami, and they were essentially split in two 
with the construction of the interstate highway that came through that community. Again, this is another example that we often cite as reasons that MPOs exist, because the easiest, and I'm going to put easiest in quotation marks, transportation decisions are often the ones that cost the less and are seen as the most efficient. And the people who usually pay the price for that in the communities and those who are usually most impacted are the underrepresented communities, those who have not traditionally had a voice in the transportation realm or transportation you know, planning world. So that's the big example. And then a small example I give you there is uh, we, have, we have a lady here who is literally sitting on a, a bucket and clearly doesn't have, you know, we have the, the illustration of the bus going by, but, you know, something as small as having, um, you know, bus stops in your community with access to express routes. Speaking back to some of that information I was talking about earlier, access to jobs, access to resources, access to healthy food, all of those things come into play when we talk about equity in transportation and really the, the life altering effect that good transportation making or good transportation decisions can have on communities. Next slide, please. So what the, does the Broward MPO come to all of this with? Well, we really wanted to, and I have them sort of in, in the little bubbles here, is how can we do more? Because again, understanding every agency that receives federal funds has required Title VI and other federal agencies requirements that need to be adhered to. So you can check a box and you can say, yes, we've done what is federally required, but we ask the question of how can we do more? And an equity assessment, looking at equity, it's not a radical idea. Historically, it's been used. It's even been used by the Broward MPO, but it was never standardized. It was project by project, or you know, department by department, as opposed to what we really were looking to do is create a standardized process. So the goal was to create something that not only took us above the standard requirements, but that was standardized across all of our plans and programs. Next slide. Now, we were talking some about the, I mentioned the prior approaches to equity. Again, the equity assessments have been used, but weren't standardized. There are primary activities as a federal agency that the Broward MPO specifically must deliver on. So we have our multi sorry, our Metropolitan Transportation Plan, which is our long range plan. It looks at, you know, the next 25 years. So we have to 2045, uh, where equity has to be kind of included. Equity is a box that has to be checked. Um, in any of the corridor and sub area studies, you know, equity is always something. And I have a slide in a few minutes. I'm gonna show you an example of that. Uh, when we look at, you know, mobility or complete streets initiatives, you know, the, the activities of, you know, this department within the MPO or even this committee, you know, you have community and neighborhood focused projects where, you know, you, you would want to speak to different uh, groups, you would want to speak to those people who are being impacted. But then last, you have our transportation improvement plan. So that's where the actual funding for the different plans and programs comes to, into play. It's the actual implementation of projects. Each of these different um, products would have a way to address equity. Now, public outreach is always a common element in those, but it's really looked very different depending on what the project is and who you were speaking to. Next slide, please. So when we were starting to think about an equity assessment, what, did some of, what are some of the objectives? What are some of the things that it really needed to achieve to have a, a wide sweeping use and to be a resource for a lot of different folks? So we knew that we need to, to consistently evaluate equity. Again, create something consistent improve the efficiency in transportation planning, more efficiently satisfy requirements. Again, going beyond just checking a box, let's be efficient in, um, in doing that or be more effective. Produce meaningful outcomes for the community. This is something that's very important because of course you could go and have a public meeting at five o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon and say, you know, yeah, we reached out to this, you know, underserved community and yep, no one showed up, but hey, we did what we were supposed to. We wanted to do something a little bit more meaningful. Also, it was about identifying adverse impacts early. That's where we talk about the environmental justice and the equity kind of working together. But then, of course, the biggest objective, I would argue, is that we were wanting to advance equity in the transportation planning process, really bring it to the top of the list and make it a priority when we're talking about transportation planning and outreach and community involvement and all of those various elements. Next slide, please. 
So the challenge became equity indicators. Well, what do you look at? Because there's a lot of information. There's a lot of different ways that you can slice and dice looking at equity. What's important? What is it? How do you make that decision? Because I can guarantee that if I was to poll every one of you on this uh, meeting today and say, what's your definition of equity? I would probably get as many different definitions as we have participants. So it was very important to come in and say, well, what do we want to focus on? What do we want to make kind of the core elements of this assessment? And then what can we build out to potentially make it more robust as we kind of grow it and, and more? So what we ended up deciding to go with was the seven federally required indicators. They're all very important, but the key there was that when we produce um, that initial output, which I'm going to show you in just a second of the actual equity assessment, we wanted it to ensure that we covered at least all of the required bases as a start. So that's where you have your race and minority, low income, disability, minority and national origin, and age. And knowing that all of these indicators, again, are federally required, yes, we were still checking the box, but we knew that we were going to be able to take this as a really strong foundation building block and really build it out to be a lot more. Next slide, please. So a little bit about the methodology, and, and I do want you to just kind of understand this because what you're gonna see at the end really is, is a map, and it's gonna be a static map, and it's gonna be color-coded, and it looks great, but it's important to understand all of the different elements that went into this and what really differentiates it from um, other resources or, or other kind of tools you might find out there in, in the transportation realm or really just in the, the community realm as a whole. So it was important that we had something that was user friendly, kind of easy to use because it really, it's great for the Broward MPO to have it, but its real value lies in getting it in the hands of others who can take this information and really implement it in their communities, in their different plans and programs. So we use Excel. Excel is a readily available program and it's a ready, readily available tool. We also use census and American community survey data. This is something that's updated every year. We knew we could keep it current, keep it relevant and ensure, because again, the last census data that we all actually, for all intents and purposes have access to was from 2010. That's a long time ago. And there's a lot that's changed since then. So again, making sure that this is something that's relevant and current to what you're looking at, a, a snapshot of today. We wanted it also to be flexible. Now, this is where I have a point that says you can turn indicators on and off. So that last slide that I showed you that had the umbrella, well, those are the seven required indicators. <clears throat> but we knew that when you're looking at whether it's community outreach, transportation planning, fill in the blank, there are other indicators that are important. There are other pieces of the census data that are important and that are valuable and that can help inform decisions that you make. Things like a zero vehicle household, or perhaps um, household with no high school diploma, or uh, a female led household. Again, that information can come to be very powerful in decisions that are made depending on the, you know, the community and the lens that you wanna look at this through. So we created the ability for you to turn those indicators on and off. So within that Excel spreadsheet, you could run it just the standard output to give you those seven indicators that are required, but then you can really start to mix in additional to really make it a customizable output for whatever your needs are. And one of the biggest things that we wanted to do was make it, a, ooh, say that five times fast, a statistically driven calculation process. We didn't want it to be something that provided any kind of, oh, well, I think this might be important or that might be important. We wanted the data to speak for itself to really ensure, because in, in, in the world of equity, like I said, we've been talking about, or I mentioned the fact that each of you may have a different definition of equity. Well, each of you may also have a different idea of, well, what's more important, what's less important? We said here, let's create something that's a standardized data set that then we can go into and help it inform our decision-making. Next slide, please. I did mention your, you know, the, the output. So what is it? It's a map. Of course, we, we work in transportation, so maps are the way that we convey a lot of our information. And it's what we call an equity scored map. Now, this is not intended to be your one-stop shop. It's not the magic pill that's gonna say, all right, equity, you've done it all, start to finish, great, you're done. No, it's really designed to be a guide to help inform you of the community 
that you are planning that transportation in, or you're holding those meetings, or you're wanting to conduct, you know, um, large scale efforts in. It's about providing a way to understand the, the community and the demographics. One thing I do always stress is it goes from low to very high. Low isn't good, very high isn't bad, and high or medium doesn't mean ah, you're doing all right. All it means is that you have a concentration of certain demographic indicators in any one area. A great example that I often use, again, I come to it from a community engagement kind of public outreach perspective. If I'm looking at this map and I know that I wanna go and conduct some outreach in a certain area, and I see that one of the, the, the sections has a very, very dark blue, well, that means there's a high concentration. Now, I am gonna show you a little bit later on, there's an interactive version of this map where you can actually click on that area, you're gonna get a little pop-up box and it's gonna actually give you the breakdown. And it might let me know, actually in this area, there's a high number of individuals or a high percentage of the population that doesn't speak English. Well, then it's important for me to then understand, okay, what languages are spoken? So that when I go and I engage with that community, I'm speaking to them first and foremost in the language that they understand. So not only does it provide confidence in that community, as myself, I'm representing the Broward MPO at that point in time, but on the very basic level, they're actually going to be able to understand, comprehend, and provide, again, that meaningful impact, that meaningful role in transportation. And that's a, a, a phrase I go back to a lot. It's about making it very meaningful. Next slide, please, Amanda. I'm going to gloss over this one really quickly, but this is really the three scalable levels that we see this equity assessment being used in transportation planning. You can look at it from a project system, kind of a concept level. That's where we're talking like our long range plans are really kind of big ticket items. We can look at it from a project development perspective. If you're doing, you know, a, a corridor study or you're looking at a specific community, a specific roadway, a specific, you know, um, as I said, corridor and then project investment. Now with the project investment, that's where you almost have to start looking at it as trends over time. Where are we investing money? Where are the projects being created that we're implementing? But sometimes it's more implementing the projects because that's as equally valuable in understanding the, you know, the real impact of these decisions. Now here we say that the goal is to ensure that equity is considered in as early in planning as possible. And that's again something that's very very important and the Broward MPO takes a, a you know a high level of pride in making sure that equity isn't just an after the fact thing it's really infused in our entire planning process so next slide please Amanda I mentioned earlier that we were going to talk about um, you know from through my lens of public engagement so that same kind of concept project development or project investment but here I've just kind of put together some of the ways in which you know you look at it from a public engagement perspective you want to look at what communities are affected and who lives there have we engaged with them before and when what's the best approach maybe to engage with specific populations what are their needs or concerns so these are really when you're looking at a specific kind of project or area and then when you start looking at it from an investment standpoint looking at those trends over time you say what are the potential impacts and benefits and have we communicated those? And more importantly, are they being monitored? Are we looking at that feedback loop and saying, we've brought in a project, we think that it's making this community better, giving access to X, Y, and Z. Well, let's go back and make sure that that's actually happening and that we're actually uh, you know, doing what we had, had committed to. Next slide, please. Now, this is one of these, you know, we like to talk about where it started, how we began this kind of um, commitment to equity and public engagement. Well, back in as early as 2011, and I will completely confess, this is before my time with the Broward MPO, uh, e equity was looked at. And here's a great example, which is the Hollywood uh, Pines Corridor study. Now, here we have, you know, three different breakdowns of three different analysis. So the first is the percentage of minority. Then we have the percentage below poverty. Then we have the percent of the zero vehicle households. Well, these are great. These are great independent data sources, but we realize where there's actual real power and real ability to influence and better things for people is when you take all of those elements and you find a way to evaluate them together 
you find a way to create a composite evaluation of kind of that piecemeal type evaluation that had been going on. Next slide, please. So this is where we are now. Again, we have that map providing that composite score and identifying key dem demographics and geographies for targeted outreach. Looking at things, you know, the one I'd mentioned, language translation, maybe access and mobility challenges. When you talk about an area that may have a high percentage of those who are disabled, well, that's going to really change the way that you interact and some of the solutions that you bring to the table. But again, it's making sure that we are identifying audiences. This tool really assists in doing that. But the one thing we always, always, always stress, and I always stress this, is you still need to be coordinating with the community leaders and the stakeholders because it, it, it's only as good as the people who actually truly are able to take it in and implement it in a meaningful way. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we, we are looking at at the Broward MPO is, uh, I mentioned that trends over time. So when I talk about this through a public outreach perspective, all of these little dots that you see on the map, those are areas where we've conducted outreach of some type. And you know they're, they're color coded, there's community outreach, there's long range transportation, networking events, schools, where have we really been involved? And it's great to see where we've been and to overlay those two analysis and say, well, this is, you know, uh, we know that this is the demographics of our community. Let's map where we've been. But again, it's almost more important to say, well, where have we not been? What communities haven't we reached? Because that's really going to make the difference when it talks, when you're talking about successful kind of community integration, because transportation projects are only good as the folks who use them. And if people are not aware of them, they're not involved in the process, that buy-in becomes a little bit more difficult. Next slide, please. And this map, we have it one more time. But again, this is all of kind of the different ways that we've used this on our level. Um, Speak Up Broward is the kind of umbrella that we use for our public outreach efforts at the Broward MPO. And what we've started doing is we've started not just doing that sort of confetti map where you look at where your outreach has been conducted, but we've actually started collecting zip codes. And then we start to map where our participants are coming from. So the people who that we're reaching out to and connecting with, providing us that information so that we can see, hey, these are the concentrated areas that we have actually uh, spoken to folks. These are the, the demographic indicators of those communities. And how do we continue to keep them involved? Next slide, please. Just very quickly, this is some of the public engagement um, outcomes that the Broward MPO conducts. You know, again, based on those specific underserved populations. One of the underserved populations that people don't often think of is, you know, that age. We talk about those over 65. We think about those a lot when we talk about equity. But what about those who are in the 10 to 16? That would be considered the youth. And so we have, you know, a few programs at the MPO specifically that target students trying to plant some of those seeds of the importance of civic engagement, transportation, how those things matter, and even careers in transportation. So that's one kind of small example of how we've taken a lot of this data and this information that we have and try to find ways to provide, you know, meaningful engagement for those different communities. Next slide, please. We're coming to the end of our presentation here. So the question then becomes, well, that's great that the Broward MPO has this, but what's in it for me? What can I do with it? How, why does it matter? So we do have a lot of resources that are available. And one thing that we've created is an information kit around the equity assessment, where we answer questions like, what is equity? What are equity areas? Um, you know, other available resources, because again, there are, we've used different resources to help inform this effort, but it's also really important to know, you know, where you can go to kind of get some of this source information. And one thing I do stress, we talk about it through transportation. I talk about it more specifically through public engagement or public involvement, but it really goes far beyond that. And the goal of this resource that we've provided is really anyone who wants to evaluate equity. If you want a snapshot and you really want to be able to capture what's going on in your community, what's the makeup of the group that you're trying to reach, can be something that is incredibly, incredibly valuable. And one quick example I'll share is that uh, we had one of our municipalities contact, contact myself uh, saying, look, we're looking at um, a new library. We want to open a new library location, but understanding the needs that a library addresses, you know, libraries provide internet resources to those who may not have it. It provides children's programs. It's a great community resource. 
And they said, can you help us basically, you know, zoom in on, on our specific municipality, take us through kind of quadrant by quadrant, help us understand the demographics of who lives where, so that we put that library in the place where it will be of the most value, meaningful engagement with the community and people will be able to use it. Now, again, that's transportation at all, but transportation then comes into play because we say, well, we're building a new library. Well, then maybe we need to look at the transit stops that are available. How do we make it accessible for walking and biking and other things? So it starts the conversation of how do we really truly create a community network that goes beyond just you know, lanes and, and that sort of thing. Next slide, please, Amanda. So if you go to the Broward MPO webpage and you go to our resources tab, that's where all of this information is gonna be available. And I've created, uh, or I've captured a screenshot there of the interactive map that I was mentioning earlier, where if you click on a certain uh, box that lights up, it's actually gonna give you the breakdown of that block group and it's gonna tell you. So it's for the example, the one that I have there, the reason why that one kind of lit up as very high is because it's got a 96, I think 94 or 96% of racial minority. So again, that's a huge and valuable piece of information for how to engage with that community. But the resources tab at Broward MPO is gonna be a great place to start. Next slide, please. So what are some of the key takeaways just for you? I know it's been a lot of information, but I really want you to understand that if you elevate equity, it can be very impactful. And this is one resource in the toolbox to help inform decision-making. Flexibility is really key. Uh, and really, you want to be working with um, partners and policymakers to really make this a community effort. Anywhere that you're going to use this equity tool, it's going to be far more impactful if you are engaging with those stakeholders. And most importantly for us was to make this information open source and available so that it's in the hands of um, you know, anyone on this call to use in a way that can really create an impact. Um, and with that, my presentation is complete. I think the last slide we have was just if there was any questions. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Amanda. Thank you for the opportunity to share. Thank you. That's, that's an awesome resource. Um, I'm sure a lot of people will be accessing it. Again, this is the Mentimeter code, and I'm going to um, stop sharing the screen so that um, y'all can answer the two uh, questions that Erica posed for us. Okay, so that's promising. Okay, so we do have a one question. Well, many questions. This is the first one. Do you know what Title VI requires from transportation agencies? And uh, we have eleven answers. A uh, seven of them, they do know. Hopefully, some of the no's turn to yeses after the presentation from Erica. I think it was a really nice presentation. Thank you so much. And again, if you have any questions, this is the right moment to do it, to do it. Let's, let's go to the next question. Okay. Do you feel your opportunities are limited by your access to mode of transportation? And we have these different options. The first one is yes to job opportunities, uh, yes to housing opportunities, yes to healthcare opportunities, yes to social opportunities, no or other. You can assign weight as appropriate. Eric, I did have a question and a comment, if you wouldn't mind answering it. Um, first off, the comment, great job with presentations, awesome information, and I really appreciate what you guys are doing at the MPO to make things as equitable as possible. One of the, my concerns, having done traffic incident management for years, we have a number of pedestrians that get struck. Oftentimes, I've seen around the nation where the crosswalks don't really necessarily line up with 
our bus stops and things of public transportation that folks use. And I know it's not an issue just per se for your office, but I don't know if anyone's figured out how we can make it so it's equitable for people who you know, are taking the bus. It's usually, the, it's usually underprivileged or people in economically disadvantaged areas. They don't necessarily oftentimes want to go all the way to a street, walk way down, especially those that, are, that may have some type of handicap or aren't really capable of walking. And yet we let them out at a bus stop, bus stop and then they cross the street and get struck in places where it's you know, not a good place to cross. And I see it down here quite a bit, especially in Broward. So I was wondering if there's anybody doing anything about that. Well, I know from, um, I can't necessarily speak specifically through it an equity lens, but I, I can give you one example that I'm aware of that's actually just, just down the road from where I'm located. Um, the city of Lauderdale Lakes along State Road 7, uh, they had a huge issue, I know, with exactly that issue with, you know, the, the crosswalks being spaced, not necessarily in conjunction with the bus stops. And actually they created, and I'm not even sure how, how long it is, but it, it's significantly long and it's, you know, a, a median, but it's designed to actually prevent that mid, mid intersection crossing. Um, and I know as well, and if there's anyone here from the MPO that, that additionally wants to speak to it, because I know this is kind of the, the wheelhouse for all of you folks, but I do know as well that this is where, you know, if I'm talking about the equity assessment, for example, it would be an issue where, well, let's look at where do these people actually live and start really talking about how do we effectively start locating or relocating a lot of these transit stops so that things do line up in a way that that helps create that equitable access. But I think I see Ricardo nodding his head, so I yeah. may, if anyone has uh, something yeah. else to contribute. Thank you, Erica. Yes, uh, Tim, great question. You know, we've been working with our transit provider, BCT, to see if we can move some of these stops because it really doesn't make sense sometimes because you literally get off the bus and your destination is right across the street, right? And, and really you have to walk sometimes a quarter mile to the next, um, uh, uh, single life intersection. So, you know, we're, we're having those conversations, you know, it's an issue. Uh, definitely moving stops is not an easy thing because they have their plan, but do, we are working with them uh, to make that, that happen. So also we're looking at and including midwell crossings at this centers, at this at these locations, because that, that could be the, the most logical, logical solution. But, you know, now the state <clears throat> and the county are open to do, to do those things. So I think we're looking into that now. So we're it's just, this, we're still working on that effort. Regarding what Erica was referring to with this, uh, where we do have a pilot project that's going on right now where they actually blocked uh, the, the, the median, they put some planters, so, so kind of forces the pedestrians to go to the intersection to, before. <clears throat> we don't really necessarily are 100% behind that effort because I think it's whatever, it's, if we can create a safer, safer, more efficient crossing would be best. But that, that is another thing that is actually taking place that, that in one of our streets, they actually have that I'm not, um, a, 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 a fence and a planter area so people cannot cross. But definitely, Tim, great point. We are working very closely with our uh, transit agency and our county and state folks to, to see if we can address that. Thank you. I don't see anybody else's hands raised. And without further ado, I will proceed with the presentation. The multimodal priorities list will be presented by Mr. Christopher Restrepo, and I'm gonna go ahead and start. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Christopher Restrepo. I am a principal planner at the Broward MPO, and I work in our planning and programming section here. Uh, today, I'm going to be presenting on one of our core products. It's our Multimodal Priorities List, or MMPL for short. You can notice in the bottom left corner, we have a little hashtag, MMPL. Uh, so yeah, let's get started. Next slide, please. So the Broward MPO has six core products. The dark blue boxes you see here comprise our MPO planning process. They include the Metropolitan Transportation Plan, the Multimodal Priorities List, and the Transportation Improvement pr Program. Our other core products that you see here are equally as important, but they include our unified planning work program, our strategic business plan, and our public participation plan. But today we're gonna to focus on the MMPL, which was highlighted in the yellow box before. Uh, so in a nutshell, 
the multimodal priorities list is used to set funding priorities for federal and state funds within our region, so Broward. Uh, but we'll get a little bit more into that in a little bit. So what you see here is our MPO planning process. Our planning process is complicated, but simple at the same time. It all starts with our Metropolitan Transportation Plan, which is MTP for short, and is our 25 year long range plan. Uh, what is, happens there is the cities, counties, and other uh, local agencies like the port, seaport, uh, airport, they all come together with the MPO and they assist us in producing the MTP. Projects from the MTP are then included into the MMPL, which is our multimodal priorities list. Our Broward MPO board approves that list and then sends it on to FDOT where they then program uh, funds generally in the new fifth year. And that becomes then the draft tentative work program from FDOT. We use that as a basis to develop our transportation improvement program, which is our five year program funding commitment to implement projects. You'll notice here in the light blue that uh, multimodal priorities lists and the transportation improvement program are updated annually. It says every year right there. And then in the dark blue, the MTP is updated every five years. Next slide, please. Okay, great. So uh, the development or the process of our multimodal priorities list. It's essentially divided into two phases, development and approval. We begin our development um, process by reviewing existing and new projects. Once reviewed, we send a first draft to FDOT so we can begin uh, coordination early. We then request the turnpike priorities so we can incorporate them into our list. Then we meet with FDOT to work out any kinks that we have with any of the projects so that we can then produce a final draft. Once the final draft is uh, accomplished or completed, we then um, go into our approval phase. And what happens there is we make presentations to our technical advisory committee and our citizens advisory committee, TAC and CAC for short. And we also do a presentation to our MPO board. Once we've given our presentations, we've updated everyone on what's new with the MMPL. We then seek for recommendations for approval and then MPO board adoption. Once all of that is accomplished, we then have a final MMPL, multimodal priorities list, that we send to FDOT on August 1st, and they begin the programming process to get money attached to these projects that we have in our list. Next slide. So what all goes actually into developing the MMPL? What you can see here is that our MMPL includes a certain amount of features that we need to do to make sure that those projects are ready for money. They are first organized by our MTP funding programs that are established within our 25 year long range plan. We also um, track the funds and phases and sources of all of the projects that are in our MMPL list. And that's shown in the document. And then we report what the funding progress is. And last but not least, what this document does really well is that it, sh it shows the incorporation of what we call program ready. And next slide please. So you might ask, what is program ready? Well, I'm so happy you were thinking about that because what that essentially means is that a, pro a project that is included in our list has a clear scope of work, a, a good cost estimate, a resolution of support from the local um, people that are in the project area and good partner collaboration. And what good partner collaboration means is if you have multiple agencies that are in the same um, area, they all need to come together and have a good uh, consensus of what's going on. Next slide, please. So what you see here is the other feature that we had, which is organized by MTP funding programs. The, the graph here shows the different allocations that we have for each of our programs. Our programs include a roadway, systems management, safety, transit, C-slip, mobility hubs, and complete street master plan. And we're in luck as the complete streets advisory committee, our highest allocated program is the complete street master plan at 25%. So we're gonna get some good projects out of that. Uh, next slide, please. So now that we've gone through all of the things that are used to develop the MMPL, let's look at what the fiscal year 2022 MMPL actually looks like. Next slide. So there is a total of 134 projects that are listed in our uh, priority list. Uh, two of them are for our UPWP, which is our Unified Planning Work Program. It's our budget to operate the MMPO. Uh, the MPO. We also have 30 projects in our CSIP pro program, 29 in our complete street master plan, one in our mobility hub program, 51 in our roadways, and five in transit and 16 within our systems management and safety program. Next slide. This is a table that will show you all of the uh, unfunded amounts that uh, by program and ownership that are in our multimodals priority list. 
you'll see that there's a total local ownership, that's the roadway ownership. We are seeking $534 million. And for state ownership, we're seeking around $1.6 billion. Of course, that's not gonna be able to happen in just one year, but that's just the total uh, that we have in our list. Next slide. Now this slide shows something really great, and you see the high fives right there, is that projects that are graduated from our multimodal priority list. And when we say graduated, we mean that they've been fully funded projects, they're success stories, and they have been removed from our list because they have funding commitments attached to them. We have four within our C-SLIP program, one in our complete street master plan, one in our roadway program, and two in our systems management and safety program. Next slide. So if you're ever curious about what this document looks like, you can take a quick little snapshot of this right here, I'll type it out afterwards, I know you can't click, but uh, this link will take you directly to the PDF that's hosted on our website. But if you need a little help getting to that website, if you don't wanna type this whole thing in, you can go to our BrowardMPO.org, highlight what we do, go to the TIP page, the Transportation Improvement Program, and then scroll down until you see uh, the multimodal priority list. It's right after TIP. And that concludes my presentation. If you have uh, any questions, you can contact me or Ji Hong Chen. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen so we can do the um, questions associated with the multimodal priority list. Perfect. So to summarize the previous questions, 32% uh, of the participants uh, thought that uh, access to job, it, is, it was the most important. Uh, and of course, uh, many of us strongly agree that it is important to include equity in any transportation planning process for Broward County. And the MTP question, is the MPO's planning process how in the MPO's planning process, how often is the multimodal priority list updated? Okay, so let's see if we <laughs> listen <laughs> what Christopher presented. So uh, we have three participants. So is it annually? Is it Yes, the is annually. <laughs> I wanted to keep it. <laughs> Great. I Perfect. Okay, so yes, it's annually. The next question, how many projects are listed in this year's multimodal priority list? Okay, so Christopher, can you give us the right answer? 134 projects, yay, people are paying attention. <laughs> yeah, so happy. <laughs> Great, thank you. And I think that was, yeah, that, that was all. Thank you, returning to you, Amanda. Okay, thank you. And that's Christopher's contact information in case you want some more information. And our next meeting will be, we're closing a little early today. Um, our next meeting will be September 13th. And this will um, end our, um, our virtual meetings. Um, after this meeting today, all of our um, subsequent meetings will be held at the Broward and Theo Boardroom. So um, that is at 100 West Piper Street Road in the Suite 600. So September 13th, 2021, we will actually see you all in person. Um, if anybody has anything they want to share about what they're working on or what they've been, um, you know, what their community is uh, working on at the moment, please go ahead and raise your hand. And I'll keep it open for the next maybe five minutes or so. But if I don't hear from anyone, I will close the meeting. Ricardo, do you want to say anything before we uh, close out the meeting? No, no, thank you, Amanda. You did an excellent job. Again, you know, we'll see you in person at the next meeting, September 13th. Uh, 13th. 
just want to thank you guys, the presenters, for being here today. Really important things about the move over law. You know, it's a powerful presentation. I knew about the law, but now I'm going to spread the word because it's so important. And of course, I'm glad uh, um, Erica came and spoke about equity. We do, do, we do take equity very seriously, seriously here at the Bar of So thank you. Thank you, Erica. And thank you, Christopher, for that great presentation on the MMPL. Thank you. And that is all I have. Okay. I don't see anybody's hands raised. So I will give you back 20 minutes this afternoon. And I appreciate it. We'll see you in two months. Yeah. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe. Thank, Thank you. you.